A very warm good morning to one and all present here. I am Dr. Krishna Verma, Professor and IT Institute of Hope you all are enjoying this site AICT sponsored Atal Faculty Development Program on Design Thinking, a patient centric approach in health industry. I welcome you all to the fourth day of the Faculty Development Program and just of the today's proceedings. First, the first session will commence uh, with a talk by Dr. Bala Ramdurai. We will start at 12 noon. Zinat Iqbal, ma'am, School of Pharmaceutical and Jamia Hunter, New Delhi. In the post lunch session at 2.30 p.m., Mr. Amit Saxena, Senior Industry Advisor and Head and Smart at the So let us start our first session of the day with our eminent speaker, Dr. Ramakurai. He has three patent to his credit and 10 plus publications in international research journals. He has co-founded PRIZ Innovation India and is an adjunct professor at Symbiosis Institute of Business Management India. He currently mentors an ad tech enterprise called Canine Electronics. He is a professor at National Program on Technology Enhanced Learning. As far as his education is concerned, Sir has a PhD from Arizona State University, U.S. and a B.Tech from IIT Madras, India. Sir has a rich industrial experience as a technical forecasting researcher and designer in the format project at Tecnico di Milano, Milan, Italy. He managed and designed the Handbook for Technology Forecasting Methodology. Sir was a systematic innovation facilitator at Mind3 Limited India, where he designed and craft, crafted 5 into 50, a key innovation entrepreneurship program. Prior to Mind3, he was a research scientist at General Electric uh, Global Research India. Sir has mentored students in an entrepreneurship course facilitated by Carnegie Mellon University USA and has been cited as an expert in innovation and creativity by Harvard Business Review. We are honored to have you sir here and invite you for a talk. Welcome sir. Thank you ma'am. Thank you for the uh, invitation. Uh, thank you Dr. Monica and Dr. Verma for uh, having me here. I'm, I'm honored and uh, delighted to be part of uh, your five-day program on a patient-centric uh, approach to uh, healthcare. So, um, uh, again, this is a, a perfect, uh, I think, timing for uh, this topic uh, because it's very relevant to what we're going through right now. Unprecedented, almost seems like a war-like situation. Some of the experiences of my colleagues and my friends and, and my students have been nothing close to a war like a world war like situation. None of us have collectively seen that, but now we know how it would have felt there back then. So with that, I think uh, there's a lot of good stuff that has come out of this situation we have been in, and hopefully uh, this approach will enhance our uh, way to look at life in general itself. So with that note, I would like to start. Uh, a quick question, uh, uh, ma'am. Uh, uh, will participants be able to have access to the chat? Will they be able to uh, answer, respond in the chat? Yes, sir. Okay, great. So I just have some a little interaction here and there. That's, uh, that's what I was asking for. Okay, thank you so much. Uh, please let me know once you can see my uh, slides. Yes, sir. The slides are visible. Okay, great. Thank you so much. So today um, I'm going to describe about a, a methodology called karmic design thinking. Okay, so it has a extra tag to what you already heard of. Probably, uh, uh, you know, people describe ahead of me, colleagues of mine probably describe 
what design thinking was and how it applies. Uh, but this uh, is going to be a bit different uh, a flavor of design thinking, so to speak. Uh, the one difference, uh, we'll come to the difference, but what's common between what you heard and what I'm going to describe, uh, we are all focused on creating, helping creating new products and new services, okay? Or if there are already existing products and services, we try to enhance that using this approach. It's a thinking methodology, okay? Uh, not only applied to design, it it came, the, the word design comes from the designer world and hence it's still stuck uh, there. Uh, however, it's the thinking where it is the focus to help us create uh, new products and services or enhance existing products and services. Okay, so that's the main focus. Uh, what is unique about design thinking? And again, this also you would have seen in the talks in the past uh, is that the and what is different between this method and say any other problem solving method is the human centricity. And in, in our case, particularly, it's a patient centric approach. The, the human is right in the center of this enhancement of creation of the product and services. OK, so this is something that you will see all, all across, no matter you're looking at the Stanford method or the IDEO uh, method or you go on to Udemy, you go to Coursera, or you even take my course at NPTEL, it's going to the, the philosophy, the, the approach, the, the focus is entirely on creating human centered products and services. So that's one thing I wanted to highlight. The, the one difference that you will notice in mine is the uh, Buddhism inspiration. So to me, uh, it is not uh, something that, you know, we've been looking at last 50, 60 years, but it transcends time. And for me, it was an aha moment. I'll, I'll describe to you uh, where this comes from. OK, so just hang on. Why is this karmic? All that those answers are coming up soon. OK, so uh, I'll start off with describing two scenarios to you. OK, so these two scenarios are have been uh, um, made into um, totally contrasting scenarios so that I, you can tell the philosophies. There are two different philosophies. Uh, there's no right or wrong philosophy. There's just philosophy. OK, and they're completely different. In real life, you'll probably be somewhere in between, but uh, there are some uh, preferences, so to speak. Let's start with the first philosophy. Is this person you see on the screen? Let's call him Bowman. Okay, so Bowman is a very uh, uh, you know hardworking person, a professor. Uh, he's a, a dedicated teacher. He's been in the system for a long, long time. Uh, his uh, main focus is whenever he wants to develop a new syllabus or add new features to his syllabus, new things to his syllabus, he looks at what is in, uh, what does the you know, the curriculum talk about? What are the trends in the curriculum? What, uh, what new novelty has come up in the research world? And all that he will boil it down into changes in his own curriculum, in his own work, okay? So that's Bowman's style, which is, look inside the curriculum, look inside what the administration is saying, what the research is saying, and from then on, put it down into uh, changes in the syllabus, okay? So as teachers, as professors, you can probably relate to uh, what Bowman does, okay? Let's contrast that with another uh, scenario or person. Is the person on the back, uh, let's call him Amir, okay? So he looks like a movie star, so let's call him uh, Amir. So uh, Amir's philosophy is that he looks at what is outside of the system. Okay, he looks at what uh, students need, what the what what uh, employers of my students need. If you are in colleges, employers of my students need. What do parents look at? Okay, all that is what he he rarely looks at anything inside the college or inside the system. Okay, and then he brings those insights into the syllabus, and of course uh, changes the syllabus accordingly. Okay, this is how uh, his approach is, uh, as different from Bowman's approach, which is look inside the college, look inside the research, and then make changes. Whereas Amir's uh, methodology is to look outside, look at the what the students are, you know, sort of trending towards, what the employers, potential employers or the students are trending towards, what do they need, and then bring about the syllabus. Okay, so here's a question to you, and let me know via chat. 
which approach do you think you would like to adopt for your own development of or changes in your syllabus please let me know via uh, the chat uh, would love to know your opinion on that what is your style bowman style of looking inside the syllabus looking inside what what people are doing uh, vis a vis compare that to amir's way of going outside looking at what parents uh, and uh, employers will need so please let me know via chat bowman or amir what's your style so obviously it should be amir amir okay all right so you think uh, students employers uh, of uh, potential employers or students uh, is what you are going to, or parents are you, what you are going to look at sir has said that abhijit sir what about anybody else any other views sir obviously amir is better amir <laughs> yes that was a given okay <laughs> okay so yeah more times than not i get the fact that uh, amir is the popular person so we'll get that all right so we'll go with that opinion so what in in design thinking we are looking at primarily the uh, amir's uh, approach not that there is anything wrong with bowman's approach uh, personally i used to be with the bowman school of thought that we should look at what is the latest and the hottest in the field and then bring it to the students present it to the students so that they can understand it but then i started slowly drifting towards amir at a later stage in my career and i said hey what students want is most important because they that keeps them engaged now i am somewhere in between i i still couldn't make a choice any anyway, so i wanted uh, our colleagues opinions on this thank you thank you for expressing that so in uh, so like i said design thinking is all about human centered design which is the amir school of thought where we look at what our uh, output is received by who is the recipient of our output uh, be it teaching be it services to uh, you know patients be it uh, you know um, in in a hospitals if you're looking at they're all human somewhere there are human beings and those who are recipient of our output they are our center of attraction so that's why design think is often called human centered design okay so anything we look at we look at human beings put them in the center we we always check it back with them okay no matter what the research finding we always uh, check it back with them so that's uh, if anything you're taking away from my talk it's this that it's human centered design so keep in mind uh, armis uh, school of thought okay so this is going to be a very very quick introduction to uh, design thinking itself there are um, you know uh, as long as four day course to six day courses uh, that you can do my suggestion is to take these principles and apply this to yourself and and that's way uh, that's the way i have learned it myself on on practically applying in in various walks of life and uh, then helping out students and other people so you can talk from experience to your students and say yeah this worked for me let me know how it works so this is going to be inter intro but my uh, strong recommendation that you go ahead and also apply it and see it work for yourself okay so these are my uh, coordinates so to speak so i would love to keep in touch with you we can uh, get in touch with me by email i'll just paste it uh, into the chat so that uh, in case you want uh, some help or on some you have some questions regarding design thinking or something uh, i i'll be happy to carry on the conversations even after uh, this talk is over so this is sort of a start for uh, for us is pasting it into the chat so that we can keep uh, connected all right so this talk has a couple of objectives uh, so let's say um, in the next week you join join back into work and one of your colleague who didn't who wasn't part of this asks you so wh what what did you uh, pick up in the uh, last few days what what is your take away and then if you are able to tell them phases and steps of design thinking then that's my one of my first objectives of the talk so this should be uh, uh, you shouldn't have to think oh what went on i really don't know that shouldn't be the case that uh, if you're able to recall yes it is design thinking and this is what we do in design thinking we able to tell that's our first objective 
second objective is the friend or the colleague gets curious and says, oh, uh, oh, that's interesting. What does that mean? And what does this mean? And you're able to sort of describe faces and steps of design thinking. For me, my second objective of the talk is done. Okay, so these are the main two objectives. And of course, I'll also add an example reference to all the good stuff we will also share. But this is the basic, basic uh, thing that I want to convey through this talk. Let's start with some background because design thinking doesn't operate in, in, in vacuum without any context. It has some context in which it operates. So I'm going to give you some sort of a context so that we can build on top of it. Usually in any organization, be it hospitals, be it academic organizations, for-profit companies, they operate with this simple model premise where ideas implemented should lead to sales or revenue from the customer. Okay. So here we call customer as somebody who is the beneficiary of the service or product, whether you charge them or not. Uh, so there could be the word user also sometimes. Uh, in our case, it could be a patient also. We may or may not charge the uh, patient. It depends on the business model itself. But usually if there are organizations, uh, if there are students even, uh, there are there is revenue involved. So how do we get revenue? Uh, and how are ideas implemented, which is far more interesting for us, is ideas implemented in the form of a service or a product. So in the case of teaching, where if you are professors, we uh, deliver a service, teaching service. Uh, if it, the course is our product, uh, if you're actually delivering products to hospitals or, or uh, uh, care centers, then you have a real product that you sell or you uh, sort of, uh, that's your exchange for uh, revenue, okay? So um, ideas, those are your ideas and that gets implemented in the form of a service or a product. The key is the implementation. There is not just ideas in our head, but they get implemented in the form of a service or a product. Okay. Now, where do these ideas really come from? Do they pop out of vacuum? Possibly not. They are meant to solve problems. Okay. There are problems like how do I find out what is the, let's say, the red blood cell, cell number of red blood cells, cells, sorry, red blood cells in the uh, in the body, right, in the blood. So that's a problem some people have. Uh, so that's a problem, right? We don't know how to do that. So the idea is to have a machine for that we do the ana analysis and then that comes in the form of a product right a, a product to do that uh, or if you take the a case of a service a teaching service let's say uh, they have no idea how to um, let, let's say design thinking yeah, that's the easiest for me uh, they don't know how where to start when it comes to design thinking how do i learn this right so the, that's the problem so my idea is oh let, let's have a course a practical short course and that will give them um, some idea of how to work with design thinking and that's my offer of service and and that will lead to revenue for me in the college right so that's that's how it, it works now whose problems are these right so that's the next question if we uh, take the backstory of problems uh, it is basically people's problems right people have problems it could be students it could be patients it could be uh, doctors even it could be caregivers they all are people and they have problems, some sort of problems or the other. And uh, we generate ideas for these problems and that leads us to a service or a product. Okay. Um, so, for example, uh, people say, oh, uh, I, I have the faintest idea of uh, getting some diagnosis done. Okay. Some basic diagnosis before I head to the clinic. That's a problem, right? So, they cannot... Uh, really find out what, what what the vitals are before they head to a clinic, for example. Okay, then we say, oh, I, I will have a self test clinic, uh, self test kit. Sorry, self test kit, right? So we think of that idea, but if you just think about it, it's not enough. So we make it into a service or a product. Uh, in this case, a product. We'll give them a kit with very basic stuff, and we will provide them to the people through pharmacies and through other stuff. And that leads us to revenue. Okay, it's easy does it. This is this works very well, right? But you can't just take ideas and start giving that out as service or product. You have to do some testing in between. You know, nobody likes untested products, right? Particularly in the uh, we we know and when it came to our vaccines, so many rounds of testing had to be. In fact, we had to go uh, forego one round of testing uh, so that people get the vaccines immediately. But uh, in normal times, uh, we, in not non-emergency times, we would have had to go through those fourth round of testing as well. So that's how important testing is. 
before something becomes a viable service or a product, right? So these are the four stages before something becomes a service or a product that can uh, yield the company or the college or the uh, organization revenue. So uh, what I say is that this is where design thinking really operates. Now, how did it become design thinking? I'll just come to that. Beyond this is what we call innovation. Okay, when when uh, when when things uh, you know bubble up from here from this realm into a service or a product which starts becoming useful enough that people start giving revenue for us, then that's where it becomes innovation. This is my my own. Thought. But anyway, coming back to these four stages, how do we know what people are going through? I just told you, oh, uh, people have problems. We'll find out what those are. But how do we know how that is possible? And how do you know that is the exact problem? People say all sorts of things, right? So, but how do we really know what people are going through? Is that the what people are going through is the ultimate problem to solve? And if what we have stuck for ideas, and what do you mean by test? What does it really involve? Like, uh, you know, so those are some things that were in my head when I was thinking about this. Turns out that I can actually, uh, so I tried to put in some verbs to help help uh, with this process. So I said, if you want to find out what people are going through, we have to empathize with them. So what does empathize really mean is understanding. Okay, I'm going to represent that with a U, understanding what people are going through. From a very intellectual standpoint, I understand uh, people don't have access to um, a self uh, check kit, right? They don't know how to uh, do a self-diagnosis. Okay, the, so I understand that is the problem. Okay, mm, uh, that is the intellectual part. Now there is also an emotional part, right? That's the feeling represented by this F. So it's the feeling that we have to get. Uh, they, they, why, why do they need that uh, that that self-diagnosis kit? Because they're fearful that they might have contracted something. Okay, they're fearful. So that's a fear, that's an emotion. And when we feel and when we understand is when we truly empathize. Okay, so that's the two components in empathize. So great. Now I know they need a self-diagnosis kit. Let's start churning out self-diagnosis kits uh, straight away. No, that's not a good idea. Why? Because uh, patients or uh, people are like children. Customers and users are like uh, babies, not even children, babies. Okay. Babies, the only language that they have is crying. So all you'll hear is a lot of sound and noise from our users and customers, but they may not be the real problem to solve. I don't know how many of you uh, remember how it was with a baby. Uh, babies, uh, when they cry, they cry for all sorts of things. For when they are bored, when they're sleepy, when they're hungry, when they're ti uh, tired or, or uh, tummy ache, all that, there's only one thing, they'll cry, okay? You can, uh, if you're a lazy parent like me, I would, I, I just take, go to solve and say, oh, here's the pacifier and stick it into the baby's mouth. But that doesn't work because in five minutes, the pacifier is out and the baby is crying even louder. Okay. So you always analyze what is the exact problem. So we find out uh, from our own experience, from domain experts, what is the problem that people are going through? Why is there a fear in the first place? What is the exact problem? What is the need for this self-diagnosis? That is what we need to find out. The unsaid latent needs. Organization and people, uh, design thinkers, who figure out the unsaid latent needs, uh, come up with brilliant solutions. It's not the quality of solutions, but the quality of problems that have been addressed by this solution. Okay. So that's the clever part, not the solution itself. The clever part is the, the unsaid, deep-rooted problem that we have really identified. And that's what we do in analysis. It's a painstakingly long process at times, but we once we figure this out, then we get use our own creativity. We're stuck for, uh, and there are some hacks that we can use to generate a lot of ideas at will. Okay, so take my course, you will know how to do that. <laughs> okay, here's my me advertising, okay. Uh, and after solve, what do you mean by test is making a little prototype. Okay, so a little test of a uh, little mock-up of what your idea really means. In case of a course, it could be a test audience you pull out and say, this is what the change in syllabus I have. Uh, let's see if it works for you. So that's a mini prototype that you try with a small segment of people. 
in vaccines, of course, they have test audience where they generate a small batch and then administer it to a small set of uh, people. But after that, we have to administer, like I said, you have to try it out with the same set of people, which means you have to go back to them. It's very iterative in nature. You always have to go back. So it's, it's never just linear and done. No, it's always going back to empathize. And then again, analyze starts, solve starts and test starts. Okay. So this is what I called uh, when I when I looked around, what is the method which came closest? Then I realized this is what design thinking is all about. I was describing design thinking and uh, it came closest to uh, what I was thinking. OK, so it's a very uh, efficient and a systematic process because, you know, in each step what we are doing, it's uh, process oriented. We know exactly what to do uh, once we are finished with one. We know how to go to the next one and all that. So we'll come back to the karmic again. Uh, okay. So empathize, analyze, solve, and test is what uh, we need to be doing in order to proceed with this whole thing before something becomes a service or a product. Okay. So in all this, I was thinking about uh, does it really stand the test of time? Sorry, before I jump to this, I was wondering about these questions of whether this methodology really stands the test of time. Is it close to our thinking? Is it uh, is it artificial? Uh, artificially, we have some process and we are following it, or is it close to how humans think itself? Is it something that we have to keep remembering, or is it naturally we do this? I didn't have any proof for that, so I kept looking and I kept looking. I couldn't find anything uh, uh, till uh, I was uh, I I was planning a trip to this place, um, and this place is Ajanta Caves. Okay, this. Is a bird's eye view of Ajanta Caves. Uh, a little closer, it looks like this. Ajanta Caves is uh, 250 kilometers from Pune, where I am right now. And uh, basically, uh, these set of caves were about 2,200 years uh, before they were constructed and uh, built inside uh, the, as holes in the wall where people used to uh, live and also worship and meditate and all that stuff used to happen here. But it wasn't the case because thousand years before, uh, about 800, till 880 people used to visit this very often. But after that, it was lost. Actually, people even forgot that these caves existed. Till 1819, when a British soldier by name John Smith discovered these caves accidentally in 1819, uh, and he trekked all the way down in his hunting expedition, and, and went up here across the river and went up here and saw that people were worshipping. And he wrote his name in, a, in one of the uh, caves also, John Smith. All these stories I, I found in my research about the Ajanta Caves. And I said, this is intriguing. Let me keep finding out more. And uh, I found more uh, that, uh, you know, pilgrims and tourists from all over the world uh, visit these caves um, even pre-pandemic. And it, the, the crowd is picking up now, uh, post-pandemic. Uh, so, um, excellent set of caves, um, sculptures, not only sculptures, even paintings. It's famous for its paintings. This one is uh, uh, iconic painting called uh, Padmapani, which is where the deity is holding a lotus. Uh, it's uh, world famous for and uh, from very well preserved 2200 year old painting, one of the oldest paintings known to uh, humanity, very well preserved. So uh, now with all these description, you might think I'm a tourist guide in Maharashtra tourism. I'm not, but I, I strongly urge that you go and visit uh, these caves. One of the key pieces in these caves is uh, Lord Buddha and his uh, statue here in cave number 26. You can see, I was talking about understanding and feeling. The feelings of, uh, you know, the empathy you feel for people uh, because they see that Lord Buddha is leaving them. Uh, you can see them, they're all sad in the bottom row of people there. And people are rejoicing at the top because Buddha is going to be with them soon. This is his last journey. It's depicted in this uh, marvelous, fantastic sculpture uh, captured in stone. So I was reading about all this on, on Wikipedia, travel uh, websites and all that. That's when I stumbled upon the teachings of Lord Buddha. The first ever lecture that he gave to his students in, uh, in Sarnath near Varanasi in a deer park. He gave it to five of his students and his teachings talked about four noble truths. Okay, uh, What are the four noble truths? The first one was called Dukkha. Dukkha is acknowledge that there is suffering. That's what he said. He just said accept that there is suffering. 
forget uh, you know knowing or whatever just accept that there is suffering indeed okay that is dukkha the second noble truth he talked about is samudaya is to delve into the cause of suffering why is there suffering at all in the first place right so it could be because of old age uh, diseases um loss of possessions or loved one could be any of these that's what he said samudaya was finding out the cause of suffering and then finally he said if you found out the cause of suffering uh, in nirodha put an end think of ways to end the suffering once and for all so that's what you need to be doing is to put an end to the suffering it's not enough if you just think of ways to end the suffering in his fourth noble truth fourth noble truth he talks about walking on the path to end the suffering or marga okay walk on the path to end the suffering once and for all put an end completely when i read this i said this is amazing because it correlates one to one with what i was thinking as phases of design thinking empathize we acknowledge that no product or service is perfect and our users patients students learners they all have some kind of problem some kind of suffering that we have to accept that is our first thing right accept and that they are going through some kind of experience that we need to be uh, aware of that's the first thing acceptance that no product or no service is perfect okay no matter how great how brilliant the product or service or the course or the lecturer or whoever else is it is not perfect okay that's the acceptance once you accepted it figure out why is the, this not uh, why are they going our users patients learners going through this suffering right so why are, what is going on why is there this problem and asking the patient asking the learner asking the student not going to help we have to apply our own mind they are like babies remember so we have to find out what is going on and uh, now think of ways to end the suffering once and for all them all, all uh, once you figured out what the root cause of their suffering is put a put an end to their suffering by thinking of ways to put an end to the suffering right so that's what we do and again this shouldn't just stop with your thoughts about oh uh, you know this course would make a big difference to my students to my patients to my learners but walk on the path and start doing taking some action towards ending the suffering once and for all so for me this is perfect correlation it has stood the test of time and in fact i was even intrigued by lord buddha's next word which said don't take my word for it apply this for yourself which is what i urge uh, you also to do is don't take uh, anybody's word but apply this method for yourself in your own course in your own students with your own patients and see it work for yourself that's the ultimate test of this philosophy okay in the, lord buddha went ahead and also talked about cycles okay so how does that correlate with what we have i'll just talk about it a bit after this okay that leads us to this question of i talked about karmic and i promised that i'm going to explain what karmic is in this design thinking what is so karmic about this right so uh, we'll get karma karma or this called karmic is based on a sanskrit word called of a, which means deeds or action okay so it's the result of our action uh, which will help us out okay let me give you an example uh, oops sorry i jumped one so this is the early, i can zoom it in so that you can see some details uh, this is the earliest calendar this is the first ever documented calendar uh from way back in uh, from the sumerian civilization about 7000 to 8000 years ago this is the first ever calendar uh, that you uh, we come across we have an uh, as an artifact okay so this is the calendar which maps phases of the moon and uh, this was uh, people felt the need to measure time to me- to predict events and and be aware of that so that was the need that uh, people identified way back when right so uh, once that need was identified that idea spread and the uh, need was pretty much constant but the products evolved so to speak uh, okay as you can see somewhere else in the on earth uh, this is the mayan wheel or the inca wheel where you have 18 months um, uh, this is the calendar also which is evolved so the need to measure time the need to uh, predict events in the future Uh, was felt 
uh, also by the Inca civilization. They came up with 18 months depicted on this wheel, uh, which had 20, um, uh, 20 days for each of them. So that's 360 days. And then five, the 19th month had five more days. So they have a solar calendar and this is beautifully depicted. Of course, closer home, uh, this is the Konark wheel, uh, which divided the cycle of time into um, uh, you know, eight hour segments, uh, sorry, three hour segments, 24 hours there. So you can actually uh, tell time uh, by the shadow. And this is a clock also. Uh, so the need to uh, measure time and predict future events uh, was there. So each of these beads is actually three minutes and you can accurately tell time uh, very, very quickly and easily with this wheel. Okay. So obviously all this learning, the karma of uh, starting from Sumerian to the Incas to uh, people in India, Indus Valley even, I was carried over the need to measure time, the need to predict events. And that's the, in about 20, 25 years ago, uh, this watch by uh, Casio also had a calendar and uh, that need was captured uh, very well. Okay, so products and services capture the need. So the needs evolve a lot, lot slower than the products themselves, right? You can see here when I, the first ever smartphone uh, was launched, the uh, calendar was definitely inbuilt. Uh, it had uh, ways to measure time to predict events also as it happened. And even in the latest version of the iPhone, even in other smartphones, you can see that the need to measure time and the need to predict events is captured also. So if you identify the need, identify the exact um, uh, patient need or the exact uh, student need or the learner need, uh, you have you can easily uh, put it into your and, and people before us would have also identified it. You just have to carry it over. The solutions keep changing it, keep evolving it I'm much faster uh, these days than before. But it's the need which is the where we need to be looking at. And, and that's why we keep focusing on the fact that human centricity is far more important. The need identification is far more important than the solution itself. That's that's why uh, design thinking is so different from other problem solving methodologies. OK, so one of my students uh, asked me, do you have a hack to remember this? I, I'm finding it difficult to remember the stages of design thinking. And uh, together we came up with this uh, acronym called EAST, right? E-A-S-T, Empathize, Analyze, Solve, and Test. So E-A-S-T stands for Empathize, Analyze, Solve, and Test. So you can remember, easily remember. So when your colleague on Monday asks you, what are the phases of design thinking? You can clearly say it's Empathize, Analyze, Solve, and Test, or even shorter form is EAST, okay? So that's what you can uh, remember. Now, I, I've already remarked to you that this is not a simple, straightforward process, but it's a very, very iterative process. So it goes uh, from empathize, analyze, solve, and test, and keeps iterating over and over again, uh, like kind of like this pattern, beautiful pattern generated by repetition of patterns of uh, one simple pattern repeat, uh, repeated, a mathematical pattern called fractals. Okay, kind of like what you will see in empathize, analyze, solve, and test. If you keep repeating it, you will come up with beautiful products and services that are useful and good looking and very, very well delivered by the application of empathize, analyze, solve, and test over and over again, as can be seen with this word fractal also. Okay, so that's, that's what I would like to tell you is that uh, any product, any service that you see, has evolved out of multiple rounds and generations and cycles and eons of this repetition of pattern of empathize, analyze, solve, and test. Okay. You see a, a patient centric uh, design thinking applied to uh, a particular machine called MRI. MRI is magnetic resonance imaging uh, used to, or, or even a CT scan, uh, they look very similar, although they work on different technologies. Uh, but the approach here used by the designer of this MRI machine was to look at it from the patient's point of view. So I don't know how many of you have been through an MRI, but it's a pretty um, harrowing experience. It's very uh, um, fearful. I was talking about feeling what people are feeling. It's, it's uh, you're lonely. Um, uh, you can't move. Uh, it's in a dark place. 
it has all the recipe for fear and anxiety okay so uh, this uh, designer uh, called Doug Deeds he looked at the whole experience from a child's point of view and said wow for adults if it is this scary how is it going to be for children okay and then he came uh, he applied he contacted Stanford for applying design thinking on this uh, particular machine and he came up with a very very interesting and novel solution which has uh, made the experience a lot more uh, rejoice so in fact children had to be sedated to be put into an MRI or a CT scan before this solution so uh, there are subtitles in this uh, uh, video uh, if you can't read them or see them uh, I would say I'm going to share this link anyway uh, let me just make sure that the sound is also shared. Yeah, sound wasn't shared. I'm going to share it now. Hi, I'm Doug Dietz. I'm the principal designer for Global Design at GE Healthcare, and I'm the lead designer for Adventure Series. The Adventure Series is really an activity that we've been working on to see what can we do around our diagnostic imaging equipment to make it friendlier for uh, both the family and for young patients. We have large diagnostic imaging equipment at GE Healthcare. They're huge and some of them make noises. Adventure Series is really looking at it really from the child's perspective, looking at where their anxiety points are and uh, coming up with some really nice solutions that help those, whether those are visually uh, taking over the room in a theme, like a jungle theme or a, a pirate adventure or something, as well as music that leads them into the room and coloring books. So we wanted to have elements that addressed all the anxiety points. My name's Liz Auer. I'm Duncan Auer. Where is this? Well, we're here today for a CT scan of Duncan's sinuses. He's had some really chronic congestion and coughing. So uh, we're going to have a, have a look and see what's going on in there. And the pirate, pirate room was pretty cool. Mm -hmm. The room was painted completely like a pirate setup, um, including the floor. The floor was like a, um, like a the dock with, with the water on the sides and uh, animals and things on the walls. And the CT scanner itself was like the wheel of a pirate ship. It's um, for a child, it, it can be kind of scary to see things that make noise and, and they look very institutional. And, and uh, it's just, you, you know, you're really thinking about the fact that you're doing a procedure. Very, very welcoming, very um, whimsical and fun. Distraction starts out with a few items to try to catch the child's attention. But you need more than that. You have to have the buy-in from the staff, the physicians, from the nurses, the technologists, and even the families. So that when they come here and they see what we've done and how we've decorated the rooms, they feel as if they really are on an adventure. And they feel when they're having their scan, there's no need to be panicked or afraid. So that when they get up out of the scan and they leave, they're walking out that door with a positive feeling. We really started um, rough with our ideas and behind me you'll see some of the, the sketches that we came up with, just pencil and pen, getting our ideas down. And, and we, we thought from the beginning what a powerful thing it would be to have a, a, a cross-functional team that um, allowed us to look at this from many different filters. We brought in child life specialists. We worked with Fern Schupek, director of the Children's Museum here in Milwaukee. We're thrilled that GE approached us. We serve, you know, 200,000 children and adults every year. I think they felt that they really could, uh, you know, be driven, their project could be driven in part by the expertise that we could offer in terms of how to meet the needs of, uh, of children and families. As an adult who's gone through scary medical testing, um, I mean, I, I know it's just tremendous anxiety. The difference with children is that, you know, our ability as adults to explain to them what they can expect. You know, children are 
are creatures of habit. They really rely on their senses to understand their world. As an adult, I walk into a hospital and I say, oh, I hate that hospital smell. You know, for a child, you know, it's why doesn't it smell like my pajamas? Why doesn't it smell like my mom? Why doesn't it smell like our kitchen? I mean, this is the essence of the childhood experience. We need to be more focused on the needs of children and families, whether it is in the context of you know, medical procedure or early childhood development as a foundation for, for doing better in school. So, and, and this is another area where I think the GE team was incredibly receptive to the message that we're carrying, which is as a community, and I mean that in, in sort of a global sense, as a community, we always need to be pushing the envelope in terms of what we can do to meet the needs of children and families and make their experience richer more rewarding if we want better outcomes. Why did why I really wrapped myself around this and, and tried my best to pull in some of the best people that I could to, to work with me is that I always kept in my mind that frightened child that was going through cancer or was really having some problems going through their scan. That is such a tough thing for a little one. It's such a tough thing for a family. And I did put my heart and soul behind it. And it it means a lot to me now that we have a solution and that the solution is helping the way it is and it's helping these families. And what a what a great thing to work for a huge company like GE, but show some passion like this that we can do something for people. Okay, so that was uh, Doug Dietz uh, talking about uh, the solution that he had come up with for uh, MRI machine, uh, that's what you saw. Um, in conclusion, I would like to say that, uh, uh, you know, you learned this. Okay, we learned this, that uh, design thinking or patient-centered approach or human-centered design has these four steps of empathize, getting to know what people are going through. In analysis, uh, we find out what the exact problem uh, to solve is. And solve, we come up with solutions, generate a lot of ideas, and build. Uh, is there a question? Okay, thank you. Okay, so in in, in test, uh, we look at what how to build the concept uh, physically and and present it back to our people. So this is what we learned in the last 45 minutes or so okay now what is the big question so you you saw how it works how it uh, where the origin is and how close is it to already our way of thinking as uh, in uh, the buddhist philosophy you can see that it's very very close to our uh, human way of thinking itself okay uh, so the first step to do for for uh, you um, the audience here is to look for uh, case studies. So you can go to your search engine and look for, uh, say, if you're into software, uh, you're a software developer and, uh, or you're into software, you can type in in your search engine software developer case studies. Uh, oh, sorry, <laughs> this is supposed to be patient centric. Uh, when you uh, when you enter it, you will find that they also have uh, some uh, search results from all over the world. People are very kind to have actually shared a lot of case studies uh, from uh, different uh, walks of life, different uh, things uh, from case studies there, uh, and they've documented it. You can learn from them. Okay, so that's the first step. So learn from what people have already done uh, in terms of case studies in your own domain. Second is to register for my own course or any course. Uh, this course is now starting in January. Uh, and uh, it's on Swayam. Uh, you can join the 20, 30,000 people who have already taken this course. And uh, the advantage is you get an IIT Madras certificate if you sign up for the exam as well. Uh, you get FTP credits for that um, along with uh, the certificate. And it's easily accessible on this website, swayam.gov.in, and look for design thinking. You'll find my course, and it's open for registration even now. Okay. So that's the second thing you can do. Uh, also, added to that, uh, I have a list of uh, references that you can use to learn uh, design thinking. Uh, my own book is available on Flipkart, Amazon, and on my own website. 
Uh, I learned a lot from Professor Carl Aldrich's book on design, creation of artifacts. And Change by Design is IDEA's founder who has uh, documented a lot of anecdotes around usage of design thinking. Some of them revolve around clinic, uh, clinics and uh, healthcare centers. Uh, Tim Brown has dedicated a lot of time in that, in popularizing the method as well as making a difference to uh, patient-centered um, approaches. Uh, if you are in a college and you are thinking about implementing this as a syllabus uh, in your college or university, uh, my own website has this as has a, a template syllabus that you can use. It's a doc version. You can download, use it the way you feel like. Okay, and then there are lots of case studies you can uh, find in IDEO and Stanford D School. They keep posting these case studies, which are very very useful. If you have a spiritual bent of mind, you can start here with the four marble truths and read all the books around that. Okay, so that's the second thing. The third thing is if you are a, uh, your learning style is visual, uh, I have documented a lot of, collected a lot of videos based on different methods, and you can uh, take that and start watching them at your leisure around empathize, analyze, solve, and test. All these videos are there. Uh, you can have uh, many of them. And if you've come across some videos that you find useful uh, and want to share it, I, I'll be happy to add them to my uh, YouTube list as well. Thank you for that. Okay. So you can search, learn, and watch. So those are the three steps. And these are, uh, of course, available uh, on my website. I'm going to share this link with you so that you can have all these references uh, and links for you to uh, have it later on. Okay. Uh, uh, there are some questions I can already see. That's great. I'll, I'll be with you shortly. Uh, some acknowledgments to uh, uh, people who have generously shared their software so that I can use them. I've used them uh, for my book, for the hosting on my website, and also uh, noting uh, you know, the, the, all the graphics that is offered from this. Uh, this method and uh, this wouldn't have been possible without conversations with Professor Picharavi and Dr. Uh, Murli Loganathan. Uh, these were instrumental in um, making the method uh, robust and foolproof and is still evolving, but has come a long way because uh, contrib generous contribution of these gentlemen. Uh, of course, lastly, I would, uh, I've already shared my links, but uh, I don't mind sharing it again. Uh, I would definitely like to keep you. And thanks for your attention. Thanks for having me, uh, being so patient. And thanks for the organizers for having me there. And I'm open to questions now. Thanks. Thanks a lot. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much. As a good teacher has the flair to simplify the concepts, uh, you very wonderfully connected the karmic design of uh, karmic design thinking with the four phases of design thinking. That is uh, Duk with empathy, Samudaya with analysis, Nirodh with solution, and Mark with the test. And uh, the takeaway uh, formula was uh, for design thinking was go is that is empathize, analyze, solve, and uh, test. So this uh, patient centric approach can be very helpful in case of children where the ambience uh, we can see the example in the lecture that where the ambience of the CT scan facility can have different themes uh, depending of the, uh, the on the different cartoons that uh, the children see. Right. So it was a very informative lecture and it was a very simplified version of uh, I th the concept was there. So right. it was a very wonderful lecture. So uh, let's take up the questions sir, from the audience. So first question is from Dr. Veena Devi uh, Thakur. Uh, which of the following stage is described as the most important piece of the four stage karmic design thinking process? Okay, great question. Thank you so much for that. Um, uh, so, in my opinion, empathy uh, is one of the key pieces, central pieces of design thinking itself. So, I, I talked about human centered design. So, for me, um, we may know what people are going through, but do we also feel what they are feeling? So, that, in my opinion, makes a big difference to how the products and services and that we offer can change. So if if I were to, I, I, I don't take sides, but if I had to, uh, you know, take sides and say, uh, you know, we don't have a lot of time, we want to do one step and do it very well. 
I would say do the empathy part extremely well. For some people, they are naturally gifted with empathy skills. They immediately know and feel what other people are going through. They they see the whole thing from their point of view. But for people like me, I have to go through a process and really figure it out. Uh, that that's that, that's why I find it useful to uh, make it a process step. But for for some people who are blessed with uh, natural empathetic skills, this is great for you. But in both cases, uh, I see that uh, empathy makes a big difference uh, in uh, in a in a product or a service that we offer for teachers, for for doctors. Uh, when you look at it from their point of view, you you see the world in a very very completely different sort of point of view. So that that would be my uh, answer to you, ma'am. I think uh, this is a very satisfactory answer for ma'am. I uh, and I will be taking up the next question. Uh, it is from Dr. Swamya Das. In which stage designers explicitly uh, explicitly state the hypothesis that they aim to solve? Okay, so this is also a very interesting question. Thank you so much for that. Um, so I'll, I'll try to attempt this. this. See, uh, hypothesis comes up when we have enough. Uh, knowledge about what the problem really is, right? So once we know we have a hunch somewhere, um, that comes in two stages. The first two, the empathize and analyze, where we find out, first of all, we are very open-minded uh, in the, uh, maybe I should go to the board. Uh, give me a minute and I will go to my board I have here, uh, and that will probably explain this a little better. Uh, okay, so uh, in, in our stages, empathize, uh, what we are looking at is called the divergent way of looking at it, right? So we look at, uh, we open up our mind and look for what is going on with our learners, patients, or, uh, you know, students, and we open up our mind. So that's the first part in empathize. That's what we do. We open up. Okay. So that's the divergent sort of uh, way of looking at it. After that, we say, okay, that's what they're going through. Some of the insights we've got, we need to start focusing and finding out what is the exact problem? What is the cause for this? So in analyze, we actually become convergent when we start looking at, and we form our own opinions at this point of uh, time. So this is where our hypothesis is uh, sort of, uh, we, we, we have a hunch saying, I think this is what is happening with the patients. Okay, we are not hundred percent sure, but we can form our opinions. We can form our hypothesis right here. Okay, once we know that, then we say, okay, now that I I'm sort of sure, let me think of solving it. And now again, we have to open up our mind and come up with ideas, all sorts of ideas, concepts, solutions that we think will solve the problem for us. Still, our hypothesis is not confirmed. We are still in hypothesis mode because these are still ideas, thoughts we have discussed with our colleagues. We are a little more sure, but we are still not absolutely sure. That's when we start converging and say, okay, now let's start testing this. You know, uh, Make it into a prototype, make something physical out of it, or if it's a service, let's start trying with a small set of audience and let's take it to them. Okay. Once we take it back to our customers, we are, we, are, we are almost sure what we had as a hunch was either completely wrong, almost correct, or it's absolutely correct. So this is when it gets uh, you know, validated okay, in, in the first round. But you will find a few more things that you probably missed in your first round, which is why we, it's an iteration. We keep doing EAST after that as well. Empathize and lay solvent test happens after that. No product and service just stops with one. It always goes through iteration. Okay, so that was my trial to answer your que uh, question as much as I could. Hopefully, it did. If you have follow-up questions, please let me know. Uh, I think there are no more uh, questions in the chat box, and I request the participants uh, they can unmute their uh, themselves and ask questions. Yeah. Yes, please. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Hello. Uh, yes, sir. Yeah. Can I ask a question? Yes, please. Yeah, uh, sir. Good morning. I am Dr. Amit Angwal, Associate Professor in uh, SVKM's College of Pharmacy, Dhule. Okay. A very good session conducted by you with lot many examples and uh, videos as well. Thank you, sir. So my question is somewhat different. Okay. So uh, now Dantakanti is creating waves among all the dental space. 
in nation wide then kalki product by patanjali okay okay before that the leader was colgate right okay so before the advent or launch of uh, dant kanti there was very uh, i mean tv commercials by colgate company aapke toothpaste mein charcoal to nahi hai namak to nahi hai ye to nahi hai so and so on and okay. baba ji baba ji launched the product with the same ingredients as per ayurveda charcoal yes. namak everything now yeah. there were uh, countless board meetings in the colgate i think then they mm-hmm. launched the same product with the same i mean different name that is colgate with shakti with same ingredient so how their conscience is in ki antaratma how it permits them to contradict their own statements earlier given ki toothpaste mein ye nahi hona chahiye wo nahi hona chahiye now they are selling all those ingredients in their item so what type of design thinking or what we humanity is it i mean i am not understand so so please put a light on this aspect also sure sir that's a very, very interesting question thank you so much for uh, asking that and sharing that uh, my own opinion on this is that um, uh, there it's it's uh, four pronged okay so i'm going to give you a, always four okay so so there are four aspects to um, the business itself four contexts if you will okay and and this is something that i recommend if you are putting together a design thinking team we need to have these four people okay so first is of course technology so whether it's possible or not can you can i make it or not now, now can i put uh, coal and uh, you know the so- sodium lauryl sulfate uh, and and uh, something else into this will it make sense will it become an explosive thing or not is it technologically is it feasible or not so that's the first set of people we'll need the technical focused technology focused sort of people next is of course we are uh, these are companies they need to show value added to their customers to their suppliers to the investors to their board even so that's the econo- economics right so the, we the whole world runs on economics so our benefits are uh, things come out of economics right so that's the people we need to involve so in our design thinking project we definitely need to have technologists we need to have economists okay so we'll look at the world from Uh, economics the third is environment okay you can't be in isolation and look at only human beings as human centered alone but you have to look at what is the impact that we are deal uh, leaving we are dealing with uh, and we have a planet which has limited resources right we have fi- we know that we are not an infinite resources anymore it took us a while but we know, we know for certain that these are all uh, in uh, finite resources so that we need environmentalists who will look at it and say guys if you do this we're going to be you know wiping out mountains or forests will go away so you need to think about how to be sustainable as well so we need that third set of people fourth is important and i think it probably addresses what you are saying is the societal or the uh, people who are plugged into societal trends uh, so the these people know what is the uh, trend of people uh, now we are all thinking natural Uh, it's not that we weren't thinking natural before, but it's now taking up limelight. Uh, everywhere I start looking for: is it made of natural products? Is it going to have side effects? Uh, you know, for me. So that's the societal trend that is there. So when you have a design thinking team, you need to make sure that all these four people are there: technologists, economists, environmentalists. and people with societal trend their knowledge of i don't know what to call them psychologists i don't know uh, people who are plugged into society they know the trends that are there so we we try to make it balanced in every team uh, often we have a overdose of technology people or economists that we miss out on the other two aspects so this makes it a fully balanced team in my opinion sir this is my att- attempt at answering your question i don't know if i came close to it Yes, sir. Thank you very much, sir. This is new learning for me that at least four uh, people should be there from four extremes. This is new learning for me. Technologists and uh, envir- environmental, eco-friendly. I mean, eco-expert, then uh, economist, and one more you told I forgot. Sir, which one? That Society, societal, societal trend. Uh, yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yeah, society. Yeah. Yes, sir. Thank you. Thank you very much. Sir. Thank you so much for that question. So we have one more question from Abhijit, sir. Uh, please, sir. Yes, sir. Ask. Yes, sir. Abhijit, sir. 
Yes, sir. Good morning. It's a very great for me to uh, listen to you on today because, sir, uh, I am listening to you since the your NPTEL course. I have enrolled on your oh, course. Oh, thank you so much, sir. Very kind. <laughs> I'm so happy to hear all the your long lectures. So my question is slightly different. So today in the era of artificial intelligence, machine learning, virtual utility, and we are actually exploring Mars. We are going to set up our entire uh, that is establishment in other planet. So, uh, but when we talk about the design thinking, we are mostly focusing on human centric design thinking. So how do you see the future of our humanity where we're going to explore new planets and we're going to, um, that is, uh, establish ourselves in outer uh, space. So how do you see design thinking in future and how we may use this concept design thinking so that in future we do not face the problems whatever we are facing today. For example, Nowadays, we are facing problems like global warming, price rise, and other kinds of economical issues. So, uh, what will be your suggestion, or what do you think the future of design thinking in next generation? Okay, very interesting question. Thank you so much, sir, for that. Uh, my my feeling is, uh, it's uh, lasted 2,200 years at least. Uh, 500 BC is when. Lord Buddha came up with these uh, principles, right? So, and he said, oh, I, I've, I'm just learned from my ancestors and just passing it on as learnings from them, okay? So it's lasted quite a long time. For me, it's it's as close to, I, I think he articulated it, but it's there as very, very close to how we think. So my gut feel, if, I, if you were to ask me, it'll last another 2000 years also because it's so fundamental to how our philosophy, how our uh, you know physiology is in dealing with our environment. Okay, so that's one one part of me which says that you know it's going to be very very similar in in, in terms of the, what it means for our current generation, our current uh, or even in the future, what it means for that will change. Of course, it will change, right? So um, uh, what empathy really means. Um, is going to be uh, in that particular context what does it mean is going to change but the fact that we need empathy is going to uh, not change at all why do i say that because i feel that as a as a uh, as a race as a species our entire survival as, as a uh, species we don't have any you know claws or any naturally built defense the only thing we have is our network is our entire humanity network and that the premise is the empathy which which sort of binds us all together right in this pandemic we found that uh, no matter where you are on the planet you are affected by it okay so no matter where i mean everywhere you go you can't hide from that it, it's that how well connected we are you know in in terms of uh, bringing humanity together and this when we go to space and when we go you know other things are happening that basic tenet in my opinion, is not going to change at all. Okay, it, that that mesh of people that we have, you know, you you are in Noida, I'm in Pune here. Uh, God knows where all the other people are logging in from. This is a very very tightly built network that we have. We see so many commonalities in spite of our varied heritage, varied upbringing. You know, your experience is completely different from mine, but we see so many common things with us. I think that's going to remain for a really really long time. It's going to really take a long time to change. But what it means for that particular time frame is going to change, for sure. What it means in that you know, 100 years later is going to be completely different because the environment would have changed. That, that's what my answer to that is. I don't know if I came close to addressing what you had in mind. Right, sir. Thank you so much, sir, for giving the nice answer. Please, sir, design thinking is the past, present, and future. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, sir. Thank, Thank you, so you much. Sir. Thank you so much, sir, so, uh, for your valuable time and be a part of the FTP program. And we'll be looking forward uh, to you for our further ventures. Of, and uh, thank you so much, sir. Thank, thank you. you. I have one question, uh, Sushma, ma'am. I have one question. Can I ask? Oh, oh yes, 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 yes. Uh, first of all, uh, I, I'm really thankful for uh, accepting our invitation for this session, sir. Thanks, ma'am. Uh, so uh, I can relate uh, each and every word of your, yours because I am also doing the same practice of Buddhism and I am also uh, 
trying to change from this technicality towards the that empathetic way so uh, i would like you to share your small journey if you can share with us your experience that how you got shifted from this that technical field towards this karmic design <laughs> I, yeah, I that, that experience. Yeah. Okay. Thank you so much. Very interesting question. Nobody has asked me what my personal journey is in this. Yeah. Thank you so much. <laughs> no, I I would definitely thank uh, you know for me the uh, big influences have been from colleagues like you, uh, colleagues, many colleagues that I've been fortunate uh, to you know uh, have their influence, positive influence on me. Uh, again all across the world you know people have really influenced me in a very positive way uh, I, i used to be you know I, i can tell you the episode is that uh, i sp usually spend 6 to 8 hours in a lab uh, and that's i was a research scientist at ge so pretty much my entire time i used to be all alone okay not not interacting with a lot of people because me and my work was all i had my focus on because that's what i was paid to do i was doing that but then uh, at times when when i would present results people say how did you do that what what is the secret behind it and i started speaking to them about what i would do what the method was and all that and uh, slowly steadily i started enjoying the experience of sharing what what i was doing uh, and so much so that i slowly shifted from this 6 hours 8 hours cooked up in a lab to 6 hours 8 hours in front of you know learners students and people whom who would share ideas willingly you would drop everything and come back and and do that like how you guys are doing it here right so you you stop stopped everything and and we are having an exchange here so so i really enjoyed and i learned more lot more uh, when when i was dealing and interacting with people uh, and uh, particularly particularly and you can relate to this because there's lots of faculty here particularly with the company of my students the students have made me a lot wiser and and they are my eyes and ears everywhere i can't uh, you know follow how the world goes my students make me do that it's it's amazing it's a, it's a oh august temples or really <laughs> uh, the um, really amazing experience to have students all along so when i'm not interacting with faculty i'm i'm, I'm with my students most of the time <laughs> that's that's how my personal little personal journey of you know moving from from lab cooked up lab work to uh, you know being with students and being with colleagues like you 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 people now thank you so much for that okay thank you sir uh, thank you so much for being with us and sparing your valuable time uh, we will uh, be starting uh, the second uh, session of today's proceeding at 12 noon so i uh, request all the participants that uh, you can have a break of uh, 20 to 25 minutes and then we can again meet at uh, 12 uh, noon uh, with the lecture of dr zina tekbar associate professor in jamia hamdard and thank you all thank you so much okay, so we'll bye bye everyone bye 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 sir